Welcome to the Recharge Podcast. This is October and Breast Cancer Awareness Month is upon us. I want to share a few statistics just to get things rolling and then I'm going to share a live interview with a patient. I recorded this a little bit ago and edited it out. It's an educational piece. Uh, the the uh, content, uh, don't be overwhelmed by the scientific part of it because we'll dive into the specifics of uh, what it means for this particular patient. The takeaway point is that you really need to work hand in hand with your professional to address this issue. Sadly enough, one in eight women in the U.S. will develop some type of breast cancer over the course of their lifetime. The kicker here is this podcast is geared largely towards men is that there are about 2,500 cases of invasive breast cancer diagnosed in men in 2018 alone. The risk remains about the same, about 1% or 1 in 1,000 for men having breast cancer. So I hope you find some value in this episode, and as always, a message if you have some concerns, and I hope you'll share it because undoubtedly this issue touches you, someone you know or love, close friend or family member. The uh, title of this one hopefully grabbed your attention, Broccoli and Breasts, and obviously with Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I wanted to shed some light on that issue, and uh, this will be a little bit different episode. I actually have a, a live patient. Um, someone I did a consult with uh, regarding some breast cancer genetic risks. And so it's, uh, I tried to do my best to keep it uh, very limited or minimal in terms of the uh, scientific terminology and jargon. I think you'll definitely get some value from it. But uh, I just want to preface this that breast cancer not only affects women, but also men. There seems to be a rising percentage of men who are affected by, by breast cancer, somewhere between 1% and 3%, depending on the uh, the. the uh, source of the data, but uh, certainly is an issue that affects men as well. And so the bottom line is that everybody or a lot of people know about the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. That really comprises the minority of risk for breast cancer. 80% comes from another set of genetic markers. <clears throat> and uh, these enzymes actually affect how a person processes estrogen. Estrogen, like many chemicals in the body, can be converted into something beneficial or something detrimental. And if it's detrimental, we want to get rid of it. We want to pee it out or filter it through the litter, liver or some other type of process to sort of clean it up and uh, minimize the risk of danger to the body. And so when a person has some abnormalities in terms of their machinery, their metabolic machinery, how their body processes things, that really can dramatically increase the risk of a condition. And for the purpose of today's podcast, we're talking about breast cancer. And so, you know, depending on how many of these abnormalities show up for a given person or patient, the risk can really go go up dramatically. And uh, so in the example uh, for today, this particular patient had five genes that had abnormalities. And so her risk is, is substantially higher. And there are specific things that can be done in terms of supplements, fish oil, dietary modifications, um, vitamin C, glutathione, selen <coughs> selenium, milk thistle, uh, indole-3-carbonyl. I'm throwing a lot at you right now. I realize that. We'll get into some more of that in the uh, discussion in the uh, recorded interview with uh, one of my patients. So I hope you find some value in this. As always, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Dr. Mitchell MD. I'd love to answer your questions. And if you're interested in obtaining uh, some specific testing for yourself, I can uh, kind of steer you in that direction as well. And so um, be sure to read the blog post that goes along with this. I give you some more information, just some, some nuts and bolts that you really want to know in terms of uh, breast cancer and trying to minimize risk. And so I hope you find this beneficial. And as always, I'd love to have a review on iTunes from you if you find some value in what I'm doing and sharing on the Project You podcast. And I uh, hope you have a fantastic week. So let's dive into uh, the interview. Thanks so much for uh, allowing uh, me to record this. Um, we'll keep all your information confidential, but as you're well aware, it's, it's breast cancer month. And so just wanted to take a few minutes to go over your, your test. And, and the test is actually a test that measures how well your body metabolizes or processes estrogen, which is a huge impact in the risk of breast cancer. I think most women know about BRCA1 and 2, which are sort of the genetic inherited breast cancers that everybody worries about from other family members. But that's really the minority of what what uh, comprises the risk of breast cancer. And so this test that you did, as you remember, was just a simple uh, swabbing the cheek and it measured uh, six different uh, markers, basically how well your body processes estrogen. I won't get into the specific genetic terms, but uh, basically you can see from your test here, those are the, the six 
six to eight that were measured in this particular test. And so um, the blue is normal, which means your body processes estrogen through that pathway normally. And the pink are, are abnormal, which means that your body's enzymes may not be able to process certain components of estrogen into a what we call favorable metabolite. What that means is basically we can take part of estrogen and make it into something that is easy for your body to get rid of, whether you pee it out or detoxify it through the liver versus something that accumulates in the body and can potentially increase your risk for breast cancer. So that's sort of the test in a nutshell. I don't know if you have any any specific questions about what you see on the report in front of you. I guess, yeah, I do. I'm worried. Um, I see that I have many variants detected, and I'd just like to know if that means that I have breast cancer or, or I'm going to get breast cancer. Sure. I mean, it's a it's a, a, a multifactorial question. So, I mean, I guess the first thing is, are there, are there cancers in your family? Yes. Uh, do you have breast cancer in your family or other cancers? Uh, breast and other. Okay. And so, I mean, certainly there's a hereditary component of breast cancer. If you have a first degree relative that has breast cancer, that certainly increases the risk. And then there are certain um, syndromes where there are multiple cancers, for example, like a thyroid cancer combined with several other cancers in, a, in one person. So those are fortunately very rare. But to get to the uh, answer, your question is, um, just because you have these markers, it doesn't mean that you have breast cancer or that, that for sure you're going to get breast cancer. We know that that uh, people who have more abnormalities in their their machinery, if you will, their met- metabolic machinery, that their risk of breast cancer can go up significantly. And so the more abnormalities you have, that certainly uh, could increase your risk. But the real issue is um, just to kind of get ahead of the uh, the whole process is that the ability of... of things that you do to yourself and what you put into your body really has a substantial impact on your risk. And what I mean by that is just simple lifestyle things like what you eat, the kind of foods you eat, whether you smoke or drink alcohol. I know it sounds like a simple approach to a, you know, a potentially a, a fatal and devastating disease such as breast cancer, but it really kind of gets to the heart of the matter of what we call epigenetics or another word that we'll throw around is nutrigenomics and not to get all scientific, but Really, food is powerful in terms of using food as medicine. And so by changing what you put into your body, you really have the, the ability to impact these abnormalities. And so, for example, you know, we, we sort of harp on our kids to eat green vegetables, but by consuming, for example, cruciferous vegetables, which broccoli is an example, you really have the, the power to sort of turn on and off some of these genetic abnormalities. And so just by altering your diet uh, based on you know the specific abnormalities you see there, you really can, can take a, a risk that might be as high as um, 13-fold and really scale that back down to something more along the lines of just a few percentage of increased risk. So it doesn't wipe out the risk, but it certainly can help your body turn on and off some of these these abnormalities or these abnormal pathways, which can really uh, improve your risk, decrease your risk, which is what it's all about. As far as as diet goes, is, are there other lifestyle changes such as um, sleep or stress reduction or... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, st- sleep is critical. Sleep is sort of the, the starting block. Everybody wants to jump ahead to, you know, can I take a thyroid pill? I'm tired. Or can I take a, a pill or a supplement or something to really uh, fix everything? But if you're not sleeping properly, your body's inflamed, your body can't repair itself, and the uh, effects of sleep deprivation are, are widespread and detrimental. It's not just fatigue, but it also affects the way your body processes sugar and carbohydrates, the way your, your um, growth hormone is able to repair or not repair the damage that occurs to your body throughout the day. And so sleep is sort of the, the cornerstone of the foundation of health that, that people often will overlook. And then you kind of asked about specific specific things. I mean, obviously not everybody loves broccoli, and there are some supplements. Uh, there's one called DIM or DIM Pro, and it's got a long chemical name for it, but that's basically the active ingredient in broccoli that you can take in a pill form. Um, that's sort of a, a proprietary name. The uh, other common name that uh, you may have seen before is I3C or indole 3 carbonyl uh, most people just call it I3C. That's just a, a simple supplement that you can take on a daily basis to really kind of shut off uh, some of these abnormal pathways and to help your body process estrogen more effectively so that you can you can turn estrogen into uh, something that's uh, beneficial. Uh, not to bore you with the chemistry of it, but when estrogen passes through the body, it's 
shunted into different pathways, whether it's a, a different chemical structure, there's a 4, there's a 16, I won't get into the specifics of the chemistry, but that really has a huge impact on whether or not this could be a potentially cancer-causing substance, or is it something that's beneficial and actually decreases your risk for cancer, and also it also has an impact on your, your mental health and bone health as well. So um, just a, a few simple changes in your diet can really have a, a dramatic impact in your longevity. Essentially, that's what this is all about, is avoiding cancer and, and increasing your longevity. So um, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, so basically this report is telling me that I have – um, a higher risk factor um, for developing breast cancer, but there are things that I can do that can decrease my risk um, in my daily life as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's <clears throat> sort of the key thing to know is is not that this, this test gives you a specific roadmap to avoid cancer, but it does point out some things that are problematic in your body. It's It allows an individualized approach to your diet and your supplements to decrease your cancer risk. And so by knowing that, you can you know, take steps to implement some of the changes, whether it's, you know, uh, limiting your alcohol to no more than one drink a day, um, really thinking hard about whether you're going to use uh, hormone supplementation or considering, some people considering in vitro fertilization, the risk for that really dramatically increases in terms of breast cancer, particularly if you have some of these abnormalities where you get huge doses of, of female hormones, the body doesn't process them properly, and it's converted into the dangerous forms of estrogen, which can dramatically increase the risk of breast cancer and other problems. So just knowing the information ahead of time really allows women to make some, some informed decisions about whether they're going to take birth control or if they're going to use hormones, what form of hormones, and uh, you know certainly if there's family history of breast cancer, um, abnormal genetics, <clears throat> certainly really want to consider and have an intelligent discussion with your, your fertility specialist whether in vitro fertilization with the uh, hormones is really the, the safest option f- uh, for you. I suppose that's something to consider too um, when going through menopause and, and some uh, hormone replacement during that time as well. Absolutely. And, you know, depending on the training of the physician, you know, classically trained physicians, on, you know, rely on oral estrogens, which as a functional physician, we know that that particularly is uh, not the route to go. The topical estrogen is really the safest route in terms of trying to uh, decrease risk of complications. Um, we know that oral estrogen can cause blood clots and, and increase heart disease and, and obviously very detrimental health effects. We haven't really found that with the topical estrogen. And the other side of the coin is it's always about balance. I mean, estrogen and progesterone are the two primary female hormones. And I see a lot of women who don't sleep well at night, particularly when they get to the perimenopausal stage, and oftentimes some supplementation with with oral estrogen, or sorry, oral progesterone, oral progesterone, which is safe, can really improve the quality of sleep. So a combination of some topical estrogen cream and oral estrogen is certainly a, an option to discuss with uh, with your personal physician regarding you know what's your devi- desired effect is um, in terms of of lifestyle, and it also again the risk based on what we know about your genetics. So definitely important things to consider. And the last point I wanted to bring up is we, we know that you have some abnormalities on your test here. And so what do you do next? And the next step would be to get a urine test just to look at some of the metabolites of estrogen and see if you have abnormal amounts in these estrogens. You really need to take the steps now to improve that. If you ignore it and, and just let the cumulative effects build up, at least in my opinion, the risk of breast cancer and other uh, disastrous outcomes uh, certainly is uh, as well stated in the literature. So I think just giving patients the information they need to really make some decisions about how they live, what they put in their body, and whether they're going to take supplements to really improve uh, the metabolism and try to decrease some of the risk is, is just you know, information is powerful, and uh, that was the purpose of this test for you is to really kind of shed some light given your family history of breast cancer, uh, use of birth control pills in the past, and uh, and some other factors. So um, do you have any other questions about the report? No, I think that pretty much goes over most of it, the questions that I did have. Thank you. Yeah, and just the, I mean, because the recommendation for you based on your report would be to either use DIM or I3C on a regular basis. Really take a hard look at your, your vegetable, cruciferous vegetable intake and, and um, the alcohol uh, limitation. Uh, you don't smoke, so that's a positive thing. And uh, there's some other supplements that, that uh, we can talk about uh, 
in the future that you might want to increase or may want to add to your diet and your regimen to really kind of improve uh, sleep and other things that are, are critical. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. If you found value in this episode and the show, please share a review on iTunes as it really helps the show get discovered. Please share your biggest takeaway. And as always, I want to help you answer the burning questions in your mind. So reach out to me at MitchellMD.com or on social media, wherever you hang out. Make today incredible, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Recharge Podcast.